morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, especially to our guests and visitors today. This is the uh, fourth Sunday after Trinity, and the order of service will be following the divine service setting. Four, it's uh, printed in your bulletins along with the hymns and the other prophets for this day. In our prayers, besides those listed, uh, we well, it is listed, but of course, with last week and over the last week, we've been praying for uh, Bunny Hines' niece, Alice Childress. Last week, I mentioned she was near death, and she did pass away on a Sunday morning. We include the family mourning her death in our prayers this morning. Also, another um, LCMS member from Brainerd who is here in Duluth uh, uh, in hospice and dying, Gordon Carlson, we'll put him in our prayers. And... Um, I think there was uh, one, oh, and also this afternoon at Hope Lutheran Church in Munger, uh, a uh, seminary graduate, uh, Stafford Thompson, is going to be ordained and installed as a pastor in that church. So we thank God for that and uh, pray for that service and his ordination to the ministry and, his, and for that church this morning. As they, uh, as they prepare for a new uh, pastor. He, pastor Walter Landauer has served there many years. Uh, he was actually in Arkansas with me years before, before I came here, and he came to the circuit before I did. So he's been there, I think, 27 years or something like that. And is still in the area. He's been serving the vacancy as well, but they've been, they are glad to receive a new pastor. And I think that's about it for certain. Uh, announcements before the service. Uh, the opening hymn is Hymn 500, Creator Spirit by His Aid. We prepare our hearts for worship and then rise to sing that entrance hymn. Thank you. 
regret that the course of this world may be so peaceably ordered by your governance that your church may joyfully serve you in all godly quietness. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading for the fourth Sunday after Trinity is from Genesis chapter 50. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph, saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. We join in singing the psalm, Psalm 138. with the lowly. 
Never be conceited. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise for the Alleluia.
grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Our text for our meditation is our gospel reading, especially the first verses of that, the first two verses, where Jesus said, Be merciful even as your Father is merciful. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Our text may be seated. Dear Christian friends, last week on the third Sunday in Trinity, in the Sunday morning Bible class, preparing for that service, looking over the readings, we had an interesting conversation about forgiveness. Of course, last week's theme was about the forgiveness that God has for us, and the, the parables, especially in Luke 15, the lost sheep and the lost coin. But that conversation that we had in our Bible class also proceeded to discuss our forgiveness of others, and perhaps one of the stickier points in that is, and it's often brought up to me, can and should we forgive others who sin against us even before or if they don't repent, if they aren't sorry for what they've done? I want to get to the answer to that question, but I want to get to it in a roundabout way uh, this morning as we talk about the readings today, especially the words of Jesus. These short words of Jesus from our Gospel, from Jesus' Sermon on the Plain, teach us one of the most important pair of truths that form our Christian faith and life with one another. And that is that, first of all, we are forgiven by God, but also that we should forgive others. In fact, the forgiveness that we offer to others flows from and is modeled after God's own forgiveness of us in Jesus Christ. In fact, it's an important part right at the center of the Lord's Prayer, where Jesus taught us in his Sermon on the Mount, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And Jesus said, when you pray, pray these words. We should be praying the Lord's Prayer each day. It is the chief prayer of the Christian faith, a prayer which in some ways, is a model for prayer, a prayer that includes everything for which we should be praying. And it includes a prayer for the forgiveness of our sins. And it's not that God doesn't forgive us without our praying for his forgiveness. In fact, we know that even before we prayed for it or asked for it, God knew and remembered our need for that. In fact, before we even lived, God planned for our forgiveness. He sent his Son into the world for our forgiveness, and he sent word of that forgiveness to us in the gospel. And yet we still pray for forgiveness. We pray for it because we are acknowledging and recognizing our need. We are reminding ourselves that God has met that need, and we express our faith in that forgiveness. When we pray this prayer, we ought to be reminded every single day of our need for his forgiveness, which goes against our natural um, inclination to kind of build ourselves up and despise and look down on other people. In fact, that's why Jesus said in the Gospel reading this morning, judge not. Of course, Jesus isn't saying by those words that it's wrong to point out when appropriate what is right and wrong. That would be self-contradictory. But in Jesus' words, he is teaching us basically to treat others as God has treated us. We will never reach a point in this life when we no longer need God's forgiveness. And in fact, we would be lost if God stopped forgiving us. Luther has a great explanation of this petition in his small catechism, of course. He said, we pray in this petition that our Father in heaven would not look at our sins or deny our prayer because of them. We are neither worthy of the things for which we pray, nor have we deserved them, but we ask that he would give them all to us by grace. For we daily sin much and surely deserve nothing but punishment. So we too will sincerely forgive and gladly do good to those who sin against us. And that last sentence is so important. So we too will sincerely forgive and gladly do good to those who sin against us. In other words, we should treat others as God treats us. And how does God treat us? Well, before Jesus taught his Lord's Prayer in his Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said these words. You have heard it said that what you have heard that it was said you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, 
Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. It's not that loving others is easy. It's loving our enemies has always been difficult. And yet this is what we are called to do. To be in some way like how God acts towards people in this world. And maybe one help, I, I recently came across a reference in writing the early church father Clement of Alexandria. And he wrote that there are those who are still our enemies, but should become brethren and ought to be treated as such already. I thought that was a powerful example. Look at people, even as they are mistreating us, even if they are enemies of the Christian faith, look at them as potential brothers in the Christian faith. There's always the hope and the opportunity that people can repent and believe the gospel in this life, and so we should treat them in that way, recognizing, of course, that our real enemy is not fellow human beings, but the devil himself. Think of the very first martyr for the Christian faith, Stephen, in Acts chapter 7. He gave a powerful testimony to the Christian faith and was being stoned to death for that confession. And his very last words were these, when falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, do not, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And then when he said that, he fell asleep. He died in the faith. Luke mentions in his book of Acts, where he records that event, that Saul was there and that he approved of Stephen's execution. I wonder, you know, Saul heard those words. I wonder if those words didn't, in a way, kind of haunt Saul and ultimately contribute to the repentance that he came to when Jesus appeared to him later. And then he was able, of course, to write those beautiful words of our epistle reading, difficult as they are, how we should uh, not take vengeance on our enemies, but live in peace and not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. So, I promise to get to this question. What, or do we need to forgive people who have sinned against us before, or if they don't repent or ask, forgiveness and apologize to us. Well, again, the best way to come to this answer, to explain what we should do, ultimately comes from remembering the fact of our own forgiveness of others, how it's modeled after God's forgiveness of us. And again, when did God forgive us? When and why did he forgive us? When, when did he plan for and accomplish our salvation? And it wasn't God didn't wait for us to be sorry for our sins and repent and ask for forgiveness. God accomplished that and even forgave us our sins in the work of Jesus and his plan for us. And yet it is also true, I don't mean to deny this, that our status before God as individuals does depend on our repentance and faith in Jesus. You know, if we, when we don't repent, we are not right with God, we might say in some ways that we haven't received that forgiveness. It hasn't been received by us. Well, how does this apply to our forgiveness of others then? We do need to forgive other people, and it's not because they apologize for their sin or are sorry for it. And yet it's also true that when people don't or refuse, that does affect our relationship with them. And, of course, there are consequences for sin, even with forgiveness. And here, I think, a great example is put before us in the Old Testament uh, reading of Je Je uh, Joseph and his brothers, how he acted in regards to them. We kind of back up a few years from when our reading took place to how Joseph acted when his brothers first came to Egypt looking for food. Joseph was, you know, had Joseph forgiven his brothers? I mean, he hadn't even communicated with his family in many years, even after coming to prominence in Egypt. 
And when they came to him, he was willing to give them food, but it, I think it's always interesting that he didn't reveal himself to them right away. He sold them food, and, and he was treated them as he did, but not, didn't reveal himself until he was confident of their attitude towards what they had done to Joseph in the past. In a way, he was testing them before fully revealing himself to them. And that can be instructive to us how we respond to people who have wronged us. It's not necessary for us to act like nothing has happened or that they haven't mistreated us, even when we do forgive them. And of course, sin has consequences affecting relationships even after repentance and forgiveness. And that's, I think, part of the point of the, the text that we have this morning in Genesis 50. Even after their father Jacob's death, the brothers were afraid of Joseph. They were afraid that Joseph would now take out on them vengeance for what they had, he had, they had done to him years ago. And we can understand why they might think that. I mean, it was a terrible thing that they had done, selling Joseph into slavery and lying about it to their father, separating the two for many long years of slavery and prison, where they didn't know each other and know what had happened to each other. And that sin also affected the brothers themselves. Even in the face of the evidence that they had been forgiven by Joseph, how Joseph had treated them kindly, invited them to come to Egypt and live there, treating them well for 17 years, blessing and loving them. And when J Jacob, their father, died, when Jacob spoke blessings over all his children, and yet the brothers were still afraid. They were terrified of Joseph. He was, after all, a powerful man. And maybe now, after all these years, maybe now they thought, Joseph might finally take it out on us. In that reading, Joseph wept because he realized that they hadn't fully realized the forgiveness that he had given to them. And he realized the power that their sins still had over them, even after all those years. But Joseph pointed them, and in a way encouraged them, by pointing them to a greater power, the power of God to turn sin and use it for good. When Joseph said, am I in the place of God? You meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. Joseph was a wise man and had a, a, a great perspective on this. It's a reminder to us, though, that forgiveness of others is hard. It's not always easy giving grace and forgiveness to others. But we do know, and this is a great help to us, that if the depth and power of sin is great, we have something even greater to help free us and to help us forgive other people. And that help is this, what God himself did for us. He became a human being in Jesus, and then that Jesus went to the cross and his own death for us and for everyone and for every sin, even the biggest and most grievous and powerful sins. Jesus himself, of course, even prayed on the cross for the soldiers, but even for us, when, whose sins drove him there when he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Forgiving other people, even our enemies, is, as I said, a, a very, very difficult task. When we search for the power to do that, we can only find it in God's forgiveness of our own sins on the basis of Christ's work, which is precisely what Jesus was teaching in our Gospel this morning. Be merciful even as your Father is merciful to you. We have been forgiven. That is why we can also forgive others. The speck in your brother's eye that sin he committed against you is small in consideration of the log of your own sin against God, and yet God dealt with that sin as well on the cross. And now we are called upon to be merciful to others as our Heavenly Father is merciful to us, to forgive as we have been forgiven, to bless those who persecute us, to feed our enemy, to overcome evil with good. That is not easy. But we are strengthened in, the, in this task because the same Christ who saved us now lives in us and with us. So we are able to move to do that through God's work in us. Thanks be to God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please rise. And may the peace of God which passes all our human understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We continue with the prayers.
O Lord, our light and our salvation, you are our strength. Work in us a worthy fear and constant trust in your mercy, that we would fear nothing else in this passing world. Lord, in your mercy, you are our prayer. As your mercy is poured out in rich measure, so open the mouths of all ministers in the church to preach your blessed and saving gospel. Be with those preparing for that office, and be with Stafford Thompson as he is ordained and installed this afternoon in Lunger. Open the mouths of all Christians to proclaim the marvels of him who called us from darkness into his marvelous light, and let our works of mercy attest the love that we have received from you. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Heavenly Father, teach all your children true humility, that we would learn to confess our sin rather than excusing or denying it. Keep us safe from all pride, which would lead us to disdain our fellow Christians who have received your mercy. Rather, make us rejoice at the patience you have shown to us in forgiving our many trespasses. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord of all, you raised up Joseph according to your plan to execute authority in Egypt, working good from what was meant only for evil. Work by your power in the leaders and authorities of our nation whom you have set in place that many would be kept alive and protected in this life through their governance. Be with the members of our military, including Mike Carl, Benjamin Halverson, Jason Halverson, Zach Halverson, Eric Jazerski, John Jazerski, Eric Johnson, David Polzine, and Nick Polzine, and with those in basic training, including Jacob Frey. Lord, in your mercy, in your prayer, receive the groanings of your church, dear Father, as we Await the redemption of our bodies and the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Turn away the corruption of sin, the futility of our fallen state, and every ill of body and soul. We pray especially for Gordon Carlson, Jane Antonson, Joanne Bullman, John Buckles, Bill Carey, Drew Chambers, Doug Chambers, Chris Urban, Evelyn Frazier, Matthew Gibson, Bill Coivisto, Tim Jazerski, Pat Johnson, Teresa Coibla, Eileen McKenzie, Diana Miller, Margaret Nielsen, Delilah Olson, Julie Reinemann, Wyatt Robison, Ray and Virginia Rodenwald, Dagmar Siebold, Dave Sorensen, Jeff Sorona, Kay Tentari, Tim, Wendy and Ashley Beard, Doug, Nancy Egbert, Lou Johnson, Katie, Carrie Jones, Lois, Greg and Marla Maddock, Deborah McKeever, Thomas Murphy, Carl Norman, Sarah Ojar, Ramona Sanders, Jeff Stevenson, Adeline Silliman, Katie Ward, Dan Spielman, Wally Schrock, Jihan Udall, and Elizabeth Zubar. Comfort us in the midst of these sufferings with a certain hope of your incomparable glory which will at last be revealed in us. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord God, maker of heaven and earth and giver of light, we thank you for all the mercies you granted our, our sister Alice Childress during her earthly life, especially for calling her to faith in Jesus Christ. <laughs> Help with the survivors who mourn her death with the hope of the glorious resurrection and a joyful reunion in heaven. Keep us mindful that we are mortal so that we will ever be prepared to die in the faith and finally receive the glory promised to all who trust in your beloved Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy. Your Merciful Father, clear away all grudges, unbelief, and impenitence from us that we may eat and drink your Son's body and blood with lively faith in his promises and receive the forgiveness you give in this blessed sacrament. Lord, in your mercy. Do I pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, you are merciful, and through Christ have promised that you will neither judge nor condemn us, but graciously forgive all our sins and abundantly provide for all our wants of body and soul. By your Holy Spirit, establish in our hearts a confident faith in your mercy. Teach us in turn to be merciful to our neighbor, that we may not judge or condemn others, but willingly forgive all and judging only ourselves, lead blessed lives in your fear. Through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated for the offering. Please, if you've not done so already, take the blue fellowship hats from the center aisle side of each pew and fill those out. Pass them to the outside and return in the back.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, for the countless blessings you so freely bestow on us and all creation. Above all, we give thanks for your boundless love shown to us when you sent your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into our flesh and laid on him our sin, giving him into death that we might not die eternally. Because he is now risen from the dead and lives and reigns to all eternity, all who believe in him will overcome sin and death and will rise again to new life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying,